Hey guys, this is Seth Kniep, Keeping It Real. We are here with a new camera. I'm very excited. I hope you guys like it. I hope that you can see better like this. <laughs> so glad to share with you some of the stuff we learned in China. And not just what we learned in China, but doing business on Amazon, having made millions of dollars on Amazon, and having done this for years, and teaching people, over a thousand people, and networking with other colleagues who are huge sellers on Amazon, some bigger than ourselves. Today, I'm going to share with you 11 myths about Chinese suppliers and factories. We actually went to China for 10 days to learn a lot of stuff that we wanted clarity on. I got tired of hearing different people blah 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 about what they thought is in China or trying to come out as experts when they've never been there and I thought, you know what, we need to go there. We want to understand what it's like. We want to understand the culture. We want to understand the factories. And so a lot of this information comes from talking to literally hundreds of suppliers, manufacturers, factories and training companies and sourcing agents. We got some of the best. We hired multiple companies to come in and help us. We did a ton. And we have a team in our office in China who helps our warriors with sourcing products. So you never have to worry again about, man, can I trust this factory? Can I trust this supplier? They manage that process for you, which is hugely helpful. They take care of customs, they take care of bonds, they take care of all that stuff. So you can just focus on, hey, here's a product I need built, get me a factory that can do it and they will work with you. Myth number one. There are factories all over China. Definitely not true. The major majority of the population is on the east side of China. China is huge. It is almost the size in land size of the U.S., but it has four and a quarter more people. So the U.S. has around 323 million people just north of that. China has 1.37 billion people. That's almost 4.25 times as many people. And the square miles is massive, however, but it's all on the east side. In each region or each province, tends to have their own types of materials that they build, whether it's Shenzhen or Guangzhou or Yiwu or whatever places they are. And some places have fewer factories and some have more, but most of it is on the east side. This is important to understand because when you receive a quote from a supplier in Alibaba, you can look at the factory, you can see their location, and if the kind of material they're producing does not match up with where you think it should be coming from, the province, you might wonder if they're a trading company and have good reason to assume so. And that is why we created a province factory resource for you. If you click the link below, you can get this for free. What it is, is it shows you a breakdown of all the major provinces of China and what kinds of factories are in each province. So for example, a factory that makes glass tends to be in one province, whereas a factory that makes clothing may be in another province, and then one that makes pottery or one that makes metal might be in another one. And this way you can check your resources and make sure that the factory or what you think is a factory is actually coming from the province you expect it to be coming from based on that industry type. So just click that link below, it's 100% free, and we'll send that to you immediately. Myth number two. Working with a trade company means I will lose money. This is one of the biggest myths. People think, oh shoot, there's a middleman, they're gonna cut some of the profit out and I'm not gonna make as much. Most of the time, you will end up making more money. Now at the beginning, will you pay a little more for the products? Yes, but let me explain to you what you risk when you don't work with a trading company. I'm not saying you have to. I've done both many times, suppliers, factories, manufacturers, trading companies, all of them. But I will tell you there are incredible pros to working with a trading company. Number one, they manage the process for you. They find the factory for you. They make sure to get the lowest prices possible that they can and they will make sure it has the right quality. Now, some people say, well, maybe they'll lie to me. Yes, there are scam artists out there, but most trading companies are not gonna do that because they realize future business depends on honesty. They're working between you and between the factory. And if they don't keep this relationship good, their business falls apart. So when you work with someone, whether you found them on Alibaba or 1688 or DHgate or even travel to China or through networking, make sure that you don't immediately dismiss them if they're a trading company. Let me tell you a story. This guy, he got a quote from a trading company, solid trading company. They gave him the best quote they could based on the exact specifications he requested. The Pantone colors, the weight, the material, the size, everything. He thought, man, maybe they're trying to cheat me. That price seems a little high. So he went, took a picture of the product he wanted, sent it to someone in Alibaba, a supplier, and said, can you give me a quote? And their price was like 75 cents a unit lower, significantly lower. 
Then he came back to the trading company all angry saying, why did you guys cheat me? And the trading company said, we didn't cheat you. We're, the price we gave you is the best price we can get from a factory. And they hadn't marked it up at all. He was angry. He dismissed the trading company. He bought from the other supplier. supplier. When his products showed up, the guy picked up the product and it began to fall apart in his hands as he picked it up. It was so bad, you couldn't even ship it to Amazon without it falling apart along the way. Like it wasn't even just a cheap product. It was like an empty case. It was ridiculous. And that's when he realized he had been completely taken advantage of because of his own ignorance. You don't just take a picture of a product and send the picture to someone and say, hey, source that for me. Give me the best price you can. What they're going to do, a lot of them, because number one, they don't know you. Number two, they don't trust you. Number three, a lot of people who approach them, they never hear from them again. So they're going to get the deal. They're going to get the sale. So they will give you a low price knowing that's going to attract you, make you send the money, send you crap and say goodbye and never see you again. And that's exactly what happened. But that's not the only way a trading company can help you. They also help to increase your confidence that you're not being scammed and they manage the process. Many of them will actually ship the products from China all the way to the US or Australia or South America or even Amazon FBA if you need that. And that's one of the reasons we have an office in China with Just One Dime who does exactly that for our clients. Because that way you don't have to wonder, oh my goodness, what do I do? And not only will they work for you, but they also will put you in contact with the manufacturers as well, if that's what you want. When we were in China and I talked to hundreds of suppliers, every time I talked to one, I asked the same question. I said, where's your factory? And I noticed something, a lot of people would look down. And I later asked my sourcing agent who was bilingual and I said, can you help me understand why is this? And she said, the reason they do that is because some companies will produce trademarks which is against Chinese law. For example, Gucci or coach purses or Nike shoes. They will produce trademarks, they will print it, and they will sell it to other people in other countries, but it's actually against Chinese law. So what happens is government officials dressed up in regular clothing will show up at the factory incognito and they're actually government. And when they find out they're producing trademarked goods, they will fine the factory thousands of dollars. That is the reason they're afraid for government to know. Now, so it doesn't mean they're all guilty. Some of them, they just get intimidated because they don't want the government to be involved. They don't know if they're being investigated. They don't know if there's some law they're breaking. It just makes them nervous. That's one of the things that China has done that has actually helped other countries. They realize America's sending a lot of money to China. So is the UK. So is Australia. A lot of money's going into China because they're buying their goods. But if they keep doing this trademark thing, the trust is going to drop and people will stop buying from there. And therefore, the government has done something about that. Myth number three. Chinese factory is a huge building with a smokestack with billowy smoke coming out the top and a lot of gears and wheels on the inside. <laughs> this is one of the biggest myths, especially to Americans. Okay, there's this guy who had this amazing product being built. It was this children's product and he loved it. And one day he told the trading company who was working with them and he was making tons of money off of it. He said, can you guys do a factory inspection? I just like to kind of for the heck of it. I just want to see what it's like. And the trading company was nervous because they realized when they go in and take pictures of this factory, he's going to want to cry because it's not what they expect. So a lot of Western minds perspective on what a factory should look like is not what it looks like in China. And it doesn't mean they're not doing an amazing job. In fact, some of the products you are selling are probably being manufactured in a room where you wouldn't even know it's a factory. It could be just one machine, 16 people stuffing cotton balls into fabric and sewing it up by hand. And it looks weird and it's kind of dirty and there's boxes everywhere and it doesn't seem organized. And then this old truck backs up and they put it in boxes in there and they take it out from there to the landing plate where they get it on the ship to ship to your Amazon FBA or your house. A lot of factories are just put together mismatch and yet the products are incredible. Not all the products are incredible, but many are. So if you have someone do a factory inspection, prepare yourself. Don't be terrified. Take away the stereotype factory and be open to what may be different. And the only thing that matters is that the product is good. That's what matters. Myth number four. Quality inspection of products that you're having produced is a step-by-step -step predictable process. 100% not true, and let me explain. If you have a product being built by a factory, sometimes it'll take around six days just to get it set up to start production. Then when they produce the product, it takes them three hours. 
So how would you have someone go in and check a pre-inspection product, mid-inspection, mid-production, and at the end? And they're not going to wait for you. Oh, you, you guys are halfway through? Okay, let me get in my car or on my bicycle and get over there really quick and inspect that mid-production product. They're not going to wait. That means losses of hundreds of thousands of potential dollars for them. So the way it works and the best way it works is when they produce the first sample, and not just a sample, but the actual production piece, the first example, the first one that you will sell, they send it or have someone show up and look at it and test it. Then they run a huge production. Then at the end, they go back and maybe one out of five or 20% of those, they will check. And if you want a hundred percent inspection, you can do that as well. The reason for this is production happens fast. It takes really long to set up like a week and then a few hours to run the actual production itself. Myth number five. When a factory produces me a product, I'm working with just one factory. Now this is a massive myth because it's usually not true. Most of the time, there were several things that went into creating that. Let me give you an example with this incredible piece of masonry. It is extremely unlikely that one factory built this. Most likely one did the molding and a different one did the painting and maybe a third one did the retail packaging. So when you work with a factory and you think, oh, I'm working with one factory, I can almost guarantee you there are multiple factories working together and they have good relationships with each other. So what happens, let's just say, for example, Bobby McGee has his squawking alarm clock idea. It squawks like a goose, so it'll wake him up in the morning. And if he doesn't wake up, it starts yelling at him, telling him to get his butt out of bed to get to work. And he's really excited about selling this on Amazon. And so he sends all the specs in and the factory who he's talking to, or the trading company, their only job is to assemble it. He doesn't realize that another factory is going to do the plastic molding, another factory is going to do the electric board, and another one is going to do the metal parts. Oh, and another one's going to do the retail packaging, who will end up sending the packaging to this assembly factory, who will put it all together. So even though you're talking to one, usually there are multiple factories involved. Let me give you another example. Let's say you are having coffee mugs produced. And there it is, right there. What probably happened, most likely, is one factory manufactured the mug, a different one painted it with this super cool mustache logo on it. And you talked to the factory that painted the mustache logo, but they got the mugs from someone else. And someone else created the packaging and they sent the packaging to the one that's painting it and they assembled it and shipped it out, you see? That's usually how it works. So next time you're working with a factory, understand one factory can't make everything. Each factory has their specialty. The factory that's doing the painting is probably not the factory that's doing the china. Myth number six. A lower quote is always better. I understand when you were first building your business, Warriors, that the first thing you want to do is make sure you're not spending too much money so you can make money later on. I get that and I understand that sentiment. But understand, in most cases, the suppliers who give you a ridiculously low quote will not decrease the price very much when you order a massively larger order. So instead of getting stuck on, man, I, this product has to be, you know, $2 a piece only, maybe they're going to charge $2.15. But when you order 5,000 instead of 500, they're going to drop the price 50 cents. So do things that will help you in the future. Work with the factory or manufacturer who will give you really good discounts on massive orders. If you think big, you'll go big. You're going to go big. You're not going to stay small. You're not going to always have a mindset of, I'm going to order 500. I'm going to order 20. I'm going to order. No, you want to get massive orders with huge discounts, make tons of profit. Then you have cash flow. Then you can build an empire on Amazon. If you aren't clear in specifications, what they're going to send you may be complete junk. So you need to tell them exactly the thickness, the color, the size, the weight, heck, the smell. I don't care. Whatever it is. So don't just say, man, I want a black, I want a black shirt or I want white shorts. No, tell them what Pantone, what color is that? What is the actual code, the hex code for the color so it actually shows up exactly as you need it? That way, if there was a problem, when you do a contract with the supplier, which is exactly what you will do, and we teach all of this on a Just One Dime team, when you do the contract, if they don't produce what you requested, you can go in and fight that case and use Alibaba's trade assurance and use the contract. Look, it says right here, this design should match this. Here's the PDF. This Pantone should be this number, but it's not the blue color we asked for, you see? So be super, super clear. This will protect you. Myth number seven.
a product sample is a sample of my product. Not true. When you first talk to a supplier and you want them to send you a product, they're giving you an example of what the product is like. An example. It could be look like this in general, but yours is going to be different because you're customizing it. Unless you're ordering exactly what they already have, which I don't recommend because that means you're not differentiating yourself, yours is going to be different. So when they first send you a sample, they're taking what's left over from a production run and they're shipping it out to you. And if they can't ship it out to you within five days, they're probably not a factory. They're probably a trading company or some other middleman. So they should be able to get it to you very quickly if they truly are a factory. And when they send it, it's, it's giving you a general idea of what it looks like. When you have your first production sample produced, that means you've given them the specs, they set up their machine, they begin to produce, and you get to see the first one. And usually that'll be through an agent who takes a picture or video of it right there on the spot so you can see and make sure you have someone on the ground in China who can check it for you. Again, our Just One Dime office in China, we have four people and another half-time worker there. They're bilingual, they're working 100% to make this process as easy and safe as possible. Myth number eight. The cost of your first order is very important. Now, I understand the desire to save as much money as you can, especially in the beginning stages of your business. However, let's just say supplier A quotes you at $2 a unit, and you decide you want to get a second quote, and you talk to supplier B and they quote you at $1.75 a unit. If your minimum order quantity is 500 for both suppliers, you're gonna save $125. That's not bad, but you need to wait. Don't just go with the best first offer on your minimum order quantity, because oftentimes the supplier who will give you a higher quote for a minimum order quantity can beat the other supplier on the big quotes because they're a larger factory and therefore they can do large orders much more efficiently and at a lower cost. So let's say you go back and say, supplier A, if I was to order 15,000 of these units, what is the price? And they say it's $1.45 per unit. Then you go to supplier B and you say, supplier B, if I order 15,000 of these, what is the per unit price? And they say it's $1.65. When the day comes when you're ready to order 15,000 units, you're going to save $3,000. So don't always do what is best for your immediate pocketbook. Do what is best for your business long term, and you will end up saving a lot more money. This principle is the difference between extremely successful business people and mediocre successful business people. Myth number nine. When you offend a Chinese supplier, they will argue with you and work it out. But in most cases, that's not going to happen. In most cases, if you offend a Chinese supplier, oftentimes they will what's called stonewall. They will stop responding except for very short, curt answers. Let me give you an example of how this happens in Iwu a lot. Some couple is super excited about starting a store and they don't know. They, don't, they heard from someone on some video somewhere, oh, you're supposed to negotiate with the Chinese. So they go into the supplier store and they're like, hey, we're really interested in sourcing these collars. Do you like how products just keep randomly showing up? This is new ability I've been working on. Do you like that collar? You can see it's really old and chewed. <laughs> and um, how much are these? And they say, oh, it's, you know, 30 cents a piece. Okay. Thank you. Then they leave that shop and go to the next one and say, they find the same product and say, hey, they said 30 cents. Can you give me a better deal? Don't ever do that. Not in person. Can you do that online? Yes, it's expected, but it is not kosher in person. Why? Number one, they might be friends. And when they find out, neither of them will sell to you or they're going to give you a higher price. Or the first company was already in their mind. They planned, I'll go down to 25 cents. But when you go to someone else, oftentimes it offends them because in Iwu, when you're in those markets, they're prices are almost bottom already because people are going to come and negotiate here anyways. And instead of playing this war of playing, oh, this pet store is going to be this low, this pet store will get lower. They already agreed to bring them all down to where they can be with a little budge, a little bit, but not much. And that's it. So when you negotiate in person in China, when you start negotiating, that means you're going to buy. If you don't buy, you offend them. And if you offend them, they're not going to have a conversation with you and explain to you the different nuances between, you know, UK, American or South American culture versus Chinese. You probably lost it. You probably, <laughs> that sounds funny. You probably lost the relationship. That's why friendship is so important. So make sure if you're negotiating online, that's fine. I don't recommend screenshotting another supplier online their quote, sending it to your original person you're talking to, that can be considered offensive and too aggressive. 
It's better to work with one supplier, not talk about the other ones, not leverage that, and just say, hey, okay, you offered me 21 cents. Would you be willing to do 19 cents? And I'll add all order 200 more. They like that. They want you to negotiate some, but don't overdo it. Because if you do, it's really hard to win the relationship back. In other cultures, you kind of fight it out. You know, you put on the boxing gloves and you fight and you fight and you work it out and you wrestle and you yell and then you're friends again. And what's funny is I've seen Chinese people do that with each other. We have this woman on our team in the office in China who works with Just One Dime. She's amazing. On the outside, she's the sweetest, most tender, nice lady you've ever met. But man, you see her get angry at a Chinese factory if they're doing something wrong, she will go into, I mean, fire mode like a beast. It is awesome. They'll do that with each other, but they won't do that with other people as much because they're saving face, they're keeping that, that formal appearance, okay? So just make sure you understand that. Myth number 10. Your greatest leverage is pretending you're this massive company and you're an agent that works for the company. Now there's nothing wrong with doing this and I don't think it will hurt you, but it won't help you as much as something else. Being a friend. In the 1980s, when the San Diego Zoo was hurting for income and they needed more people to visit the zoo and they were way over budget, people were saying they need to close down, they began to negotiate with the Chinese to bring in a panda from China as a featured exotic animal where people would come to the zoo to see, and it worked. But in the process of negotiating, they brought in an expert who understood Chinese culture. And the expert said, number one thing you need to do is work on being friends be a friend. If you can win a Chinese person over as a friend, then the trust is there. They will go above and beyond for you. Chinese are some of the hardest working people on earth I've ever seen. I've visited many cultures. I'm blown away at how hard they work. You want them working with you. They will help you, but you have to work on the relationship. Now remember, it's not like relationship friends here in the US where, you know, we don't, we're not supposed to lie. We're really open about everything. It's more of a professional friendship, but it's still a friendship. And the more you work with them, the more they will open up and be honest with you about the positives and the negatives. And that brings me to the 11th myth. And this is the most overarching important one of all. Chinese way of doing business is the Western way of doing business. That's a myth. Now that might seem obvious. Well, of course it's a myth, Seth. I'm a different culture. But what practically most people don't apply that thought when they go and talk to Chinese suppliers. When I went to China, I sat down with an agent who is an expert in all things Yiwu and factories. And I said, listen, I understand that the Chinese way of doing things is you want to say yes to every opportunity, whether or not you can do something. And I know that honesty in business is not nearly as important as honesty in family in Chinese culture. I said, look, unless you're honest with me and tell me the good and the bad, we have no business relationship. I need you to be honest. We, I want to do this different. So will you please be honest and you will have my business. She responded incredibly well and she began to tell me the good and the bad. And she told me a lot of stories that helped me to understand how Chinese culture works. That's the kind of relationship you want, but it takes time. I noticed when I was there in China, I got way better quotes than I've been getting on my products from here in America. Something about being there gave me a lot more negotiating power and they can tell you're serious. See, when you contact someone at Alibaba, they think they're never gonna see you again. They think you don't know what you're doing and so they're gonna do everything they can just to get the sale and be, and be gone. What you want to do is establish relationships and if you do that, it's amazing what you can do. I met someone in China and after only seven days of knowing her, she has decided to work for just one dime. She is now adding on to our team in China and she's an expert in sourcing. That we do this so that our warriors can get the best of the best and be de-risked as much as possible. So understand that honesty in Chinese business is not gonna be as common as you would expect in Western and therefore, assume when you start working with someone, they don't trust you. They want your business, but they don't trust you. It's not that they distrust you, but they don't put trust in someone unless you've given them reason to. Whereas here, I think in America, a lot of times we just kind of assume more trust, but also get taken advantage of. And if you look at Chinese culture, it makes sense why they're more guarded from the past and different things that happened to China. You can see how it affects business today, and it's actually worked very, very well for them. China is an absolutely amazing country. The people there are incredible. I am going back soon and I cannot wait to get back. The only reason I came back home was because I missed my wife and my kids. That's it. I wanted to stay there much longer because there's so much to do. If you need help understanding sourcing, 
if you want to work with a team of people in China who are part of Just One Dime, this isn't a contractorship, this is a partnership, it's an extension of Just One Dime, who can help you with sourcing, shipping, customs, uh, quality inspection, getting certificates for children's products, all of these things, finding the right factory, finding the right source, working with a factory who only speaks Mandarin, if we can help you, we will. Click the link below, learn more about our team, we're here to help you. But either way, I wish you success in this world. And if you get the chance, go to China or come with us because it's amazing. Have an awesome day. Thank you.